gosh, look at the crowd. Come this way. Those who spread goodness radiate happiness to everyone around them. Introducing LOLC Finance Credit Cards. Fuel the goodness in you. You love the feeling of being renewed. To stay beautiful every single day. To breathe just like we do. Because you are truly delicate. Protecting the ones who've been with us through the years. With Sailac Care, the only wood coating that truly protects you. Sailac Wood Coatings from Jet. Welcome to LMD TV. I'm Fazmina Imamdin. Joining, joining us uh, today is Dr. Nishan Bimel. He is the executive director of Verite Research. He has vast experience in academia, policy, and private sector as an economist. Dr. Nishan, I warmly welcome you to the show. Thank you, Fazmina. At this point, there remains a significant amount of uncertainty at all levels, whether it be political, economic, or global. I'd like to know, in this backdrop, uh, in this backdrop, do we uh, expect uh, a economic growth or contraction, or do you think it is still too early to put a number on this? Fazmina, thank you so much for inviting me on the show with LMDB TV. Uh, it's great to be here, uh, and I think it's an important question you're asking about the outlook for Sri Lanka in the future, what awaits Sri Lanka uh, in this troubled time. You know, what happens going forward really depends on how we manage uh, ourselves and our economy at this time. <clears throat> I think, uh, as you know, there are countries that have, have handled debt restructuring rather well and come out in four to six months uh, out of a restructuring process. There are other countries where the lack of government stability and credibility and political consensus uh, has delayed the process rather a lot and have gone on sometimes for you know more than a year or two uh, without getting the debt started. So when you get your country into uncertainty uh, and difficulty uh, politically and managerially, that's when you also tend to have lower growth. So Sri Lanka is currently, unfortunately, on that second path where the debt restructuring process is not being managed uh, as quickly or with as much credibility uh, as would be uh, in countries that have done it quickly. Uh, so I think we are on a path to do this a little more slowly than we ideally need to. Uh, and because of that, uh, because the shortages of fuel, uh, of electricity, uh, of essential inputs to industry are continuing and getting aggravated. I think the central bank has already predicted that Sri Lanka will have a lower level of growth, maybe going to a contraction of negative growth. And the contraction that we will face in 2022 may be larger than the contraction that we had uh, during COVID period. So that is the current outlook in terms of economic growth. Okay, Dr. Nishan, uh, so we cannot deny that prevailing situation calls for prudent debt restructuring. Now, what are the options and potential obstacles in implementing a suitable payment plan? Yeah. So debt restructuring is a complex process, right? Um, and the options for the, the big options with, with regard to debt restructuring uh, that Sri Lanka makes a choice over, I think, is about restructuring not just external debt, but also domestic debt. Um, and you've heard many people in government uh, who are leading the process say at the beginning that domestic debt restructuring was not on the table, that that was not being considered. However, when you look at Sri Lanka's total debt, which is over 120% of GDP and increasing right now, uh, and 
more than 50 or 60 percent of it um, is in domestic debt. Uh, the problem is that to make debt sustainable uh, with so much domestic debt, you've got to either get the external debt holders to take a very deep cut or to be willing to restructure domestic debt as well. So if you want the whole burden passed on to external debt, then the cuts may be so deep that negotiation and agreement on that could take a long time. Uh, so there may be some advantages in, uh, in restructuring domestic debt. One, because you know, it makes the debt more sustainable and you could potentially have lower levels of inflation. Now, inflation is another way of restructuring domestic debt. You effectively tax that debt through inflation. So I think Sri Lanka must weigh the cost and, benef and, and, and benefits uh, of restructuring domestic debt. And that option does need to be considered carefully. But it's not only you know, restructuring debt that Sri Lanka has to do, because making debt sustainable is also about looking at your future expenses. We have to look at uh, how much the government keeps spending on the public sector. How do you build an efficient public sector? Uh, can the government continue to fund the government pensions, uh, which are extremely costly? Uh, so it's all about debt sustainability, ultimately. And that's the restructuring process. It's not just about debt. Uh, it's ultimately about the fiscal management overall. So the obstacles and obstructions, I think, uh, to getting this done right uh, is ultimately, you know, the political capacity <laughs> uh, to to uh, to create uh, you know social agreement about the process uh, and to and to also be appear as acting in a fair and reasonable way so society i think will support the government as long as the government is seen as credible uh, in its action reasonable uh, and acting with social societal rather than vested interests in mind but the moment there's a suspicion of vested interests, I think uh, there could be a lot of obstruction, even amongst creditors, if there's a sense that different creditors are being treated unequally uh, and that this is not a fair process, uh, that could become an obstruction. So really Sri Lanka has to, uh, has to engineer credibility and fairness uh, uh, in the process, both with creditors and with society as well. So are we equipped and resourced enough to run multilateral debt restructuring programs with many parties at a time? So let me just talk about the different creditors that we have. We have uh, what you call the private creditors. They hold uh, the, uh, the bond market, for instance, and in the, in the financial markets, there are private creditors. Then you have what you call official creditors. They are usually other countries, bilateral creditors. Uh, mainly for Sri Lanka, that will be Japan, China, India, uh, that are our major bilateral creditors. Uh, then, uh, so th th then you have the multilaterals that you talked about, uh, that are the ADB, the World Bank, uh, in in the main that have funded us. It's generally agreed that multilateral debt will not be subject to restructuring. Uh, it's concessional debt, it comes as aid, uh, and multilaterals will usually continue to support Sri Lanka in a debt restructuring process by providing funding. Uh, but all parties usually agree that multilateral debt will not be restructured, right? So the, the real problem is with the official and the private creditors and how they look at equity in amongst them in restructuring. So it's very important to achieve category level equity that is that you you know you may not always treat official creditors exactly the same as private creditors but amongst official creditors they all want to be treated the same uh, so so supposing you treat china in one way japan or india may not be willing to accept deeper cuts uh, or or stronger terms of restructure than china accepts uh, likewise, amongst bondholders and other financial market lenders like Exim banks, etc., uh, they may insist that all of them get treated the same way and not differently. So, uh, so I think within categories, at minimally, you need to establish a strong sense of equal treatment and fair play uh, in order to drive agreement. 
in the lines of equal treatment and fair play, I would like to ask about the SMEs in our country. Now, what do you think would be the best way to, for, the, for the state to intervene and help SMEs to stabilize from the repercussions of, the, uh, of our economic crisis? Fazmina, that's a very good question because, um, uh, and let me put it this way, that in a debt restructuring process, it is easy to imagine that this is simply a budgeting problem or a fiscal problem or a monetary problem, that, uh, that all you've got to do is cut your expenditure, increase your revenue, make your debt sustainable. Uh, but of course, you know, cutting expenditure and increasing taxes are really elementary things that child's play. Uh, the real problem uh, to solve is not that. The real problem to solve is how do you make life uh, livable uh, for people in Sri Lanka? Uh, and that includes uh, businesses that are functioning in the productive process, providing people jobs, livelihoods, uh, 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 producing the essential needs of society. So if we don't think from the position of SMEs, from the position of employees, uh, from the position of human beings that must live and survive in our country, then we are likely to get this quite wrong, right? And, and simply just increase taxes and cut expenditures in ways that can balance a budget but not make the economy and human life succeed in the country. Uh, so SMEs are having a very tough time right now uh, simply because the cuts in electricity, fuel, as I said earlier about what leads to negative growth, are hugely impacting, especially the ability of smaller companies to succeed. Sometimes very large players have different ways of negotiating uh, these things for themselves. Uh, it's also about imported inputs that are essential for production. So we don't simply import in produced with things that are made in Sri Lanka. We also uh, combine it with things that we import and lack of foreign exchange, constraints on customs and clearing uh, are impacting SMEs. I think you also have a problem with terms of labor. So people are also exiting the country, especially capable people, uh, because with the depreciation, dollar-based salaries are much more attractive and there's a huge sense of uncertainty. Uh, orders, uh, export orders to Sri Lanka also are diminishing uh, in some way because the country looks like it's in uncertainty. So for all of these things, uh, I think you need uh, to create more certainty, more clarity, and more confidence in, in the political leadership and decision-making structure. Uh, and you also need to solve the solvable problems, the logistical problems. You know, it's one thing to have a shortage of uh, petrol. It's another thing to make people wait five, six hours in queues unnecessarily. So finding ways to deliver uh, what's in short supply that reduces the pain, increases or reduces the uncertainty as well, I think is extremely important for functioning of business and for human life in Sri Lanka also. Absolutely. Uh, in the next six months, Sri Lanka will require nearly six billion dollars to address the critical shortages of essential goods that you were just talking about. Now, what can we anticipate in terms of forex inflows for the rest of the year uh, amidst this high uh, level of perceived risk uh, from foreign investors due to repatriation of funds, a possible further depreciation of Lankan rupee? Foreign investors had already, I think, abandoned Sri Lanka uh, very significantly over a long period of time, in fact. And I don't think it makes sense to assume that foreign investors will turn up quickly or in any significant way. So most of foreign investment um, had exited Sri Lanka in different ways over time. And if you look at our FDI performance, even in better times, uh, even when the country looked more stable, uh, we were not attracting foreign direct investment. So this is not a time to think about that uh, seriously. I think that would be too overly optimistic. Uh, even though, you know, I, I'll park the question about the port city and the incentives, but creating 40-year tax holidays to get investment doesn't make a lot of sense because it is these tax holidays themselves that has ultimately got Sri Lanka into such a, you know, poor state of public finance with revenue being such a low 
uh, level of GDP. So we have to think intelligently about that. Okay, uh, foreign. Uh, I think the the largest opportunity for forex inflows in Sri Lanka has often been worker remittances. Uh, tourism has played a smaller part than we imagine because there are outflows that match the inflows of tourism and Sri Lanka may also be overestimating uh, its tourism revenue. But when we talk about forex inflows, let's focus on that. That was about you know, $7 billion uh, plus uh, every year. Uh, that has reduced by 50% right now uh, from, uh, from one year ago, right? Uh, mainly because you know people had lost confidence in the government, uh, lost uh, you know seen Sri Lanka headed to a crisis, uh, and found that on the unofficial market they can get a higher price for what they're remitting than they can get from the government or official channels. Now that is unfortunately still the case. So as long as you maintain this sense of shortage, uh, as you know, whenever there's a shortage, whether it is for bread or for you know, some other kind of item, the price goes up uh, and people are willing to pay more because more people are competing for something that is limited. So I think until you solve the problem of shortage, uh, it is difficult to avoid there being an unofficial rate. Uh, and it is difficult then to prevent the kind of, uh, you know, lack of remittances and lack of inflows that Sri Lanka is going through. Uh, so I think Sri Lanka, because of the great instability that we've gone through and the lack of credibility even of central bank and policies uh, in 2021 and much of this year, even if it seems to have achieved some stability, we'll need to maintain and build back the, some of the credibility that was lost before worker remittances can be moved back into official channels. So unfortunately, the answer to your question is that we don't seem to be getting a quick resolution on that. Uh, at the moment, uh, forex inflows are not coming back at the level that they were in the past. Uh, and building back once again, uh, credibility and a sense of certainty about the future, right, uh, is going wow. to be critical. Then what about the IMF uh, funds? Where do we stand on discussions with the IMF? Yeah. Now, in your view, when should we expect IMF funds to start coming in? And do you think this is the redemption that Sri Lankans are waiting for? Yeah, so another great question. Uh, and let me just talk about the process. I think this is quite important uh, with regard to the IMF. Um, the IMF does provide balance of payment support. That is, they will give uh, foreign exchange uh, that will help Sri Lanka in the short term uh, and to gain some level of stability. However, the IMF will not be in a position to give Sri Lanka funding until it assesses that Sri Lanka is on a path that which will make its debt sustainable. And that's very important. So I'm going to work backwards to how do we get the IMF funding. So in order to decide whether Sri Lanka is on a path that makes debt sustainable, IMF will need to see that Sri Lanka has renegotiated or renego restructured its debt with its creditors. Uh, in a significant enough way that then would allow for the assessment that Sri Lanka's debt is sustained. Uh, as I said, that will run into the whole problem of external domestic creditors that can be quite a tortuous process uh, before it reaches a level that there's confidence that Sri Lanka will get agreement and debt will be sustainable. But before you even get into this negotiation, you you have to know how much you need to reduce your debt or the net present value of your debt in order to make that sustainable. That comes out of uh, analytical process in which the IMF also helps. Uh, it's called the debt uh, sustainability analysis that the IMF does. And when it provides that debt sustainability analysis and says, this is how much you must reduce your debt, right? That acts as a credible anchor, if you like, for both the creditors and for Sri Lanka in terms of its negotiating targets. Because if Sri Lanka said, I need to cut debt so much, and the creditors said, no, you only need to cut it this much, uh, you know, it's very, each has a vested interest and it's hard to agree. The IMF acts as kind of a neutral, credible, uh, analytical anchor for that process. For the IMF to give you a debt sustainability analysis, you've got to provide, in a way, uh, your fiscal management plan. Okay, and how you're planning to raise revenue and how much revenue you're planning to raise going forward and in the future. Uh, and what your budget deficits are. Uh, 
Now, I think we are still at that very early stage where we are trying to figure out, well, uh, what, are, what is our future fiscal plan in terms of budget deficits? Uh, what are we hoping to increase government revenue to? Uh, and the debt sustainability analysis and the fiscal plan may need iterative uh, improvement. So IMF, you know, if we, if we talk about a staff level agreement, which is which has some of these elements in it, but actually, even after you agree, you may find that the debt sustainability analysis shows you that the cuts need to be too deep. Uh, so you then restructure and say, no, maybe I, this, I have an alternative fiscal management plan. And, and there is a process of fine tuning that needs to happen, even to have a good analysis that starts discussions with creditors. So I think, uh, unfortunately, the IMF is uh, not able to sort of may, we have a magic wand and help you. There's a lot of hard work to be done uh, to formulating an uh, analytically driven path for Sri Lanka's future. Uh, and, and then being able to forge agreement on restructuring uh, debt accordingly before the IMF can land with money. Now, I've said the best performing countries did this in, you know, in, even in the last few years, did it in four to six months. Uh, we thought given the way that Sri Lanka entered this process in a disorderly way with the reserves at zero, that initially we thought it would take Sri Lanka six to nine months perhaps. I think given the political instability and the lack of, you know, the confusion uh, in the leadership, decision making and, the, and not enough investment in analysis also, I now expect this to take at least 12 months or, or maybe even 12 to 18 months uh, before Sri Lanka can, for, you know, at least get the debt restructuring process complete with creditors. But I would say if starting from April, at least perhaps 12 months before IMF money can land in the country, uh, even though a lot of people are more optimistic, uh, I think, uh, you know, it may be good to understand that uh, the process is moving too slowly right now uh, to get the six to nine month outcome that we were hoping for. Um, I'd like to get back to the SME sector. Yeah. So is there a need to consider debt moratoriums and the like, as we did during COVID? And if so, can the banking system manage this? So I think uh, the debt moratoriums during COVID was simply because, um, yeah, companies had that debt that they couldn't pay back. Um, and, you know, either way, you have a problem for the banking system. If people can't pay back the loans, uh, then the non-performing loan portfolio builds up and the banking sector gets into trouble. If you have moratoriums in a way, those can be supported by government and banks can be provided certain minimum amount of funding through even third parties. So that's where multilaterals can come in, uh, in helping giving bank funding lines uh, to maintain moratoriums that are reversed later. So, as I said, you know, what is really quite important is to have in place systems that enable businesses and human life to function uh, in, a, in a minimally adequate or so way, because if you, if, you, if you destroy economic growth, you destroy debt sustainability as well. Uh, ultimately, debt sustainability is a function of the percentage of your debt uh, in terms of your gross domestic production. So debt, debt looks very unsustainable when your economy has poor growth or negative growth as well. Uh, that's just as bad as increasing your debt level. Okay. So I think it is a critical question you're asking. Uh, how do we solve the problem of SMEs uh, and you know, in normal people that are having jobs and working and trying to live in the country? Uh, currently, I think there isn't uh, analysis, uh, you know, adequate analysis out there uh, that even understands the problem. <clears throat> Uh, effective. Uh, but I think uh, the attention you're drawing to the problem is extremely important and the government does have to come up with a package. I think not just for how government finances function, uh, but how SMEs uh, and how people uh, are able to function in a situation where electricity you know, prices can go up two or three times, uh, where fuel has already you know, uh, gone up over 100%. Um, in cost, I think about 150% soon. Uh, so in such a situation, you've got to find solutions uh, for people to be able to function with the incomes that they have and the businesses they have. And I think the attention you're drawing, Fazima, 
uh, to making this part of the thinking about restructuring, I would say is very important and hasn't had the required attention yet. Now, uh, when we spoke about IMF, you said we might have to go back and rethink. So recently, uh, it was announced that the government's going to reverse the tax cuts for 2019 in order to raise revenue. Now, many neighboring countries are used uh, as a resource for bridge funding. Are we looking at bailouts and advantages here? And with the support of this sort, how soon can we bounce back? Yeah. So let me st start with the bridge funding. You know, there's always this idea presented that, you know, we are negotiating with countries that are going to give us bridge funding. It's highly unlikely <clears throat> that people can come with bridge funding until you can show that you are debt uh, your debt sustainability goals uh, are going to be achieved quite soon. Nobody wants to give you money to bail out your creditors. So, of course, we have suspended, uh, you know, repaying creditors, which helps the process. Uh, but especially with regard to offering Sri Lanka more financing to meet essential imports, people will worry about whether their debt is going to, their debt, that debt is going to get restructured. So you have to give guarantees that you're not restructuring that debt. Uh, and that's a problem. And you've got to show that you're on a pathway that is highly likely to succeed with restructuring and debt sustainability. So even bridge funding, I think, we look for the progress that you have on that path of negotiation with the IMF and look at how the IMF evaluates your position. Uh, so bridge funding can't come a lot sooner than IMF funding. Right. Um, and it, it will still take time. So there's optimism right now that a staff level agreement uh, will get you, you know, closer to bridge funding. Uh, I think that that a staff level agreement may still be too shallow an achievement uh, to unlock bridge funding that we'll have to show a lot more significant pro uh, progress along the way uh, before bridge funding is able to land. So. Uh, that's why I'm saying the, this process could have happened in four to six months. Right now, we are on a slower path uh, to this process. There was also a first part to your question before you asked about bridge funding. Uh, that is about tax cuts. Okay. Now, I think it's again, remember the, the fatal tax cuts that Sri Lanka implemented starting 2020 January. Uh, you know, what was fatal about them, uh, I think, from a decision-making perspective, is that they were done without analysis. Nobody evaluated the consequences to, uh, the, you know, the economy and to government finances from those tax cuts. Now, what we might be doing in reversing those tax cuts may also lack analysis. So that's rather sad. I think, you know, it, it's very important that we not simply reverse the policy that we thought failed, but that we reverse the uh, actually habits that have failed for the country. And the habits that have failed are non-analyzed decision making, a lack of proper understanding of the consequences of government action. And I think what we haven't done is put back an analytical process inside government that can tell us, because tax cuts now will impact businesses and human lives in a very, or, or reversing tax cuts in a very different way to how they were impacting lives when they existed at that time, because lots has changed in the economy. So uh, the facts have changed about the economy. And simply reversing policy doesn't take us back to where we were. It can have a lot of other consequences that need analysis. Uh, so a simple thing to do that I think Verite has come out talking about and we'll, you will see a lot more in the news is even before you increase the taxes uh, that you place uh, on, uh, on people and businesses, you improve the tax collection methods that you have dismantled. So that's a no-brainer because the pay tax collection, the withholding tax collection, these are very efficient methods of tax collection that Sri Lanka can put back. And we have calculated that, you know, Sri Lanka can get, the government can increase by between 0.5 to 1% of GDP in revenue simply by putting these back. And you'll see publications uh, to this effect quite soon. So Verite has created what we call the Verite Research Sri Lanka Economic Policy Group, uh, consisting of international economists and local economists to really think through the process uh, and drive analysis. But I think we need that same thing replicated in a larger scale within government. Uh, if we are to move 
forward effectively on these important decisions. Um, so what we see here is Sri Lanka being in a very tight position and we need to think out of the box to find solutions. Now in that line, I'd like to ask, why haven't we been able to focus on large high growth sectors like IT, you know, in the likes of India has done and broaden our export revenue base. And I have another question. We also have uh, skilled intellectual individuals uh, who can offer remote service to other countries and bring in uh, forex. Like, uh, uh, now, has Sri Lanka looked at this option? And how can Sri Lanka facilitate foreign remittance through this? and create opportunities yep. for remote workers or basically so Sri so very important question i think that you know sri lanka needs to not focus on one or two industries but the but all opportunities should be opened up you know the job of government uh, sometimes isn't picking winners and losers in terms of success for exports but creating a platform uh, and a basic functioning infrastructure in the country that allows everyone to succeed and allows those who can succeed better to succeed better, right? Um, and you're perfectly right. It, it is often government that gets in the way of the success of skilled individuals or different sectors like IT. Uh, and I think it is about the rules that you put in place that allow people to do business well. Right. So if you are a skilled individual, are you able to offer services internationally, get paid, uh, you know, refund the money? Uh, we don't even have PayPal. Uh, and that, or, you know, even well before this structure, it was very hard for people to get paid because PayPal will say, well, if your government doesn't allow us to issue a refund, if there's a dispute, then we can't, you know, give you a full PayPal account and we can't let you function in this way. So. And, you know, so many poorer, weaker countries or countries that we thought are poorer and weaker have solved these functioning infrastructure problems, these platform level problems, where the government creates a conducive uh, system uh, and infrastructure for businesses and individuals to actually produce, uh, export their services and succeed. And I think with IT sector, it is the investment in IT education. I mean, we have a shortage of supply of workers and capable people for the industry expansion. When large businesses in Sri Lanka in the IT sector wanted to grow, they had to go to India because they just didn't have the recruiting capacity in Sri Lanka. Uh, the fact that our education, especially in the public sector, is not demand driven. Uh, in terms of what the economy needs, that uh, there is no system uh, to actually shift resources to where there is greater demand. These are fundamental weaknesses in political leadership, decision-making, uh, economic management in Sri Lanka. And I think this is a good opportunity to recognize these weaknesses and start solving them because they will solve them, as you say, multiple other problems uh, for the economy, for revenues, uh, and forex as well. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Uh, my last question is about the global economic uh, climate. The inflation is high in the US and many other developed economies and the global commodity cost has skyrocketed. My question is twofold here again. Do, uh, how do you expect the global backdrop play out for the rest of the year? Uh, do you expect contraction? Uh, and then my second question is, what does it signify for Sri Lanka in the midst of a political and economic turmoil that we are in? How should we receive this news? Yeah. So uh, it is unfortunate, as you're pointing out, that Sri Lanka is headed into a very significant crisis of its own making uh, right around a time when the global economy is also turning adverse in terms of the conditions that Sri Lanka faces. So just the increase in the price of oil uh, is quite an adverse situation in the best of times. Uh, in, the, in the worst of times that Sri Lanka is in, of course, it becomes what you call a double whammy, right? It, it hits you much harder uh, because you don't have the cushions and the ability to negotiate that shock in oil price increase. Uh, likewise, the, there's the global inflation that is kicking in 
uh, is would have made imports uh, and inputs more expensive for the country at the best of times. At the worst of times, when we are short of foreign exchange, uh, we have no confidence in our economy, this becomes much harder uh, for Sri Lanka. So Sri Lanka is certainly, I think, experiencing this problem uh, at a time when the global conditions are also adverse and difficult. Uh, and it is a very bad time in, uh, to be in this situation. So it's like having, um, you know, if you had a, illness uh, say a lung ailment or whatever in normal times that would be bad but if you had it during covid that's doubly bad because you know hospitals don't want to admit you uh, the, the risk of other infections are greater so sri lanka is really having that kind of situation i think right now which makes it even more important that we handle uh, this process rationally analytically uh, and with political leadership that has credibility and acceptance both externally and internally. Now, so we must do the things that we can do well, because the consequences of not doing them are far more significant than when you have external cushions and you know conducive environments uh, externally to help you through a process, right? Even with regard to concessions and uh, global uh, sympathy, uh, with Ukraine, Russian war, other calamities in the world, uh, Sri Lanka doesn't come all the way right on top uh, if it is mismanaging itself. So there's no time uh, in Sri Lanka's economic history where good management, uh, credible, trusted political leadership, uh, and an analytical approach uh, that makes the best decisions more important than it than today. Thank you very much, Dr. Nishan. Sri Lankan cannot Sri Lanka cannot afford a blame game or a political hot potato approach to this crisis. Thank you very much for taking the time to answer realistically to a number of ambiguous questions that are looming over us. Thank you very much, Fazima. It was great to be on the show, uh, and thank you for your questions and for great hosting. Thank you. With that, we end the show for tonight. Thank you for joining with us. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Good night.